Hello, are you at the point of your storytelling journey and you want to start drawing comics but you're not quite sure where to begin? Today I'm going to show you how to draw comics digitally starting from a sketch, going to inks, and then finishing off with color. The techniques I show you in the penciling and inking phase are program agnostic, which means any program that you're familiar with, you can use these same methods. For coloring, I use Photoshop and that's what I demonstrate here. It's what I'm most familiar with. I believe most of the techniques and concepts are universal in terms of using shadow and light to render an object. And a lot of these same methods will work in Clip Studio, but if you're working in something like Procreate, some of the more technical aspects of the method won't necessarily translate one-to-one. -one. The theories behind what I'm doing will translate, but maybe the techniques by which you flat a page or something like that probably differ. I've put chapter markers so you can skip ahead. Like if you already know about penciling and inking and you just want to get to the coloring, you can skip ahead to that section. Disclaimer, drawing digitally makes certain things a little faster. I don't have to wait for inks to dry to move on to certain sections of a piece. If I want to fix something, I don't have to cut out a piece of paper and paste it on and redraw stuff. I can just erase with my digital eraser. And I don't have to worry about mixing paints in the right shade every time. I can just, you know, save swatches and all that kind of stuff. But none of this is automated. Just because you draw on a computer doesn't mean that things are happening automatically. There's no button yet in Photoshop that says, draw me my page the way I want it to look. Drawing of any kind takes time, it takes practice, and it takes patience. So if you find that you're getting stuck or something isn't turning out the way you want it to, that's okay, that happens to all of us. And the only way to get through to the other side and to really improve with your work is to push through the suck. We all hit walls, we all hit blockers, there's always things that get in our way, but if you push through, you can make it, you can improve, you can make something that looks close to what you had in your head, and it'll be awesome. So no more preamble, Let's draw something. Sketching in Photoshop. If you can draw a sphere, a tube, a cube, or cone, you can pretty much draw anything. So let's start with a, a little brown ball and I'll sketch in the hat thing. Vaguely look, va vaguely owl looking hats. Um, and there you go, done. <laughs> We've done sketched in Photoshop. Uh, all right, so um, just kidding. All right, I, I kind of want to change the angle. So uh, use the lasso tool, select what you want, and then I'm on a Mac, so I would hit Control T for transform. I believe on a PC it's Control T, and then. Um, Let's see, I'm going to change the origin down to the bottom of the neck and then turn it slightly here. Deselect and then move this around. Um, so I, some people just start into the face right away. I like to, to kind of draw the, the, the general shapes, the, the underlying features of a shape before I get to the details to sort of give me a structure to build my lines upon, which you won't see in the final version, but I like to have an understructure of what I'm drawing. It, it, it gives it the feel like there's something underneath. It's not just the lines, that there's a structure underneath what you are drawing. When I do my comics, um, my sketches are really loose, but for this demonstration purpose, I think I'm gonna get a little bit tighter than I normally do for the sketching just to give you an idea of what I'm looking at. Uh, again, I'm using the lasso tool and the transform tool, and I'm changing the origin uh, by grabbing this middle star here and then moving it to the bottom of the neck. Um, I mean, I could leave it in the center, but I like to just kind of move it down. And to uh, to transform, uh, to to move the size so that it's it stays the same shape or the same proportions. Like I could just grab this and then do this, but that's not exactly helpful. So um, I'm gonna hit the shift key. And so that makes your transform proportional. The other thing I'm gonna do is hit shift key and option or shift and alt on a PC, shift and option on a Mac. And this 
makes the transform center around the origin. So because I moved the origin down to the neck, it's going to do this kind of thing. I'd hit enter, deselect, back to the brush tool. I try whenever I draw or ink or sketch to, to move around the composition so I'm not focused in on one part so that I take in the entire canvas as I go along. Um, so you'll see me uh, hit the space bar and, and move around a lot. I constantly draw and redraw noses. Um, I suppose I should figure out a specific way that I draw noses, but every time I draw a nose, it looks slightly different. I actually start with the nose when I ink, if I'm inking characters with faces. It's personal preference. All, all of these, um, these tone fill-ins are just kind of to give me a feel for the character and the shade and the shapes that I'm working with. They won't necessarily show up in the final inking, but they help me uh, define for myself what I'm trying to get across. So for once, I like the face. Shoulders are way too close together, so I'm gonna extend those out a little bit. Um, and let's see. I'm gonna deal with some of these other things on a different layer. So uh, I'm gonna start a new layer. It's a good idea to label stuff, even if you're just drawing for yourself, because you might come back to this months from now and forget what's going on. So I'm just gonna start labeling things like a smart person. All right, face. Uh, and actually while I'm labeling things, I'm gonna create a new folder and I'm gonna call this sketch because I am gonna use this stuff um, for inking. So put that all under there and uh, we'll go hand. This is how Jamie draws hands. Big lump, another lump, and then another lump, and then we're good. All right, and this is when switching opacity helps. So I'm gonna take the opacity of the, the face layer down a little bit so you can see me struggle with how I draw hands. Um, bring it down a little bit. Just don't wanna cover the whole face. Bring that back up, Just full opacity full opacity, and on then full opacity. This is gonna be kind of a mess when I ink it. I'm just kind of giving myself a roadmap here. Um, it could be a lot more specific if you want to, but I kind of like to let those weird happy accidents happen when I'm inking things, especially if it's a creature. So for this, I'm just kind of outlining, outlining the basic structures and the, the the geometry I want to keep in mind when I'm inking. A vague wing shape. Let's give her some gauntlets or some kind of arm covering. This is the creepiest owl ever! Whee! This collar can push out a little bit. Now what I like to do is sort of change the color of the lines. Lock both of these layers. Once you've locked the transparent pixel, pixels of your layer, go to your colors and pick a color that you would like to change it to. So I like blue. I'm going to use a blue. There you go. Option delete or alt delete fills the current layer that you've selected with the foreground color. So if I was to do that on the background layer, it would make it all blue. And if I want to fill it with the background color, which is the white, I would hit command delete and I, I think it's control delete on a PC and I want to do that with the owl layer as well. Because I have put both of these layers in a folder, I can collapse this folder and turn down the general opacity of the folder and then both of those layers will become more transparent as I scroll through this. It's stretching time! <sighs> It's always a good idea to take a break, especially when you're going from one process to another. So once you're done penciling, take a break. Once you're done inking, definitely take a break. Give yourself a chance to reset, shake out your hands, wiggle your fingies, stretch out your arms, straighten out your back. Remember, your body is a tool and you have to maintain it well. So if you've been hunched over all this time, try to sit up straight and stretch it out, move your shoulders, wiggle around, Get into it. It's inking time. Before we get started, I noticed that her hand is somewhat gigantic. 
I guess I could say it's a style thing, but I'd be lying. So I'm gonna lasso the hand and shrink that a little bit so it's not so friggin' massive. And that seems like a more appropriate size. I do have a, a set of inking brushes that I like to use, but I'm just gonna use the default stuff because uh, I don't want you to have to go out and buy things in order to follow along with this tutorial. I am going to create a new group and call this the inking group, ink. Well, I have all the sketching, all my, my sketches in a group here that I can turn on and off or I can lower the opacity, which is what I usually like to do. I like to give my lines a little bit of a personality. So uh, when I ink, I usually start off thin, a little bit of pressure, go to thick and then thin again as opposed to drawing a line that's the same width all the way across. This line on the left, to me, has a little bit more personality. Towards the middle here, it seems to have a little bit more weight, and towards the edges, it gets a little bit more thinner. It gets more thinner. It gets more thin, which um, also indicates like a, a lighter feel to it, whereas this this line is, is a, isn't very interesting in and of itself what it defines might be really cool. Like this could be um, the edge of like a, a mech or something like that. But by itself, this line, this straight line isn't very interesting. Now, when it comes to a more animated cartoony style, you'll see thin lines like this all over the place because the line itself doesn't matter. What it's defining matters. That's a personal taste. Um, and that's the way I, I approach inking. I like to start with the, the nose. So, essentially, yes, I am tracing, but I'm adding depth and <laughs> weight to what I'm inking. Always turn your page. So even if you're inking on paper, um, it's best to, to, to turn your paper around. Pulling a line towards you helps keep your hand steady so you can pull a straighter line like that. Um, rather than pushing a line away from you. It's a little bit more janky, uh, unless you're going with a fast motion. So um, pulling lines towards you gives you a lot more control, which is why it's a great idea to turn the page. Use thicker lines to define the outlines of a shape, and then I'll go back in with a thinner line and bring out some of the, the details and fiddly bits, and that's not so much of a thing when I'm drawing a face, but you'll see when I work on the monster part that I'll use these thicker lines to define an area and then go back in and, and really noodle around with uh, creases and folds and other weird crap. Depending on my mood, I'll either go back in and render the, the pupils or stuff like that, or I'll just leave it for the coloring. Um, haven't decided yet, so. Always remember to zoom out in your work just to see how it's going. Um, it can get really easy to just kind of zoom in all the way and, and get lost in, in the details, but you want to kind of zoom out and see if you like where things are headed. So the navigator gives you a small window anyway um, if you don't have a dual screen setup. So you can set this and just kind of put it to the side and then, you know, work as close as you want. And instead of zooming out, you can just take a look to your left and, and check out the navigator and see if it's, if it's looking the way you want it to look. So I'm gonna use this red color to sort of uh, better define the silhouette here, kind of map out where I'm going. Yup. This is what it takes, folks. <laughs> Lots of scraggly drawings. All right, I'm gonna turn that down a little bit just to kind of blend that in and then turn all of that crap down. All right, so uh, cause things might get a little bit crazy, I'm gonna start a new layer, get back to black. And like I start with the person, I'm gonna start with the beak or the nose of the owl-like monster creature. Gotta give it up to Malibu Comics uh, in the 90s. 
for coming up with a lot of the digital techniques that we still use today to color comics. Um, they kind of pioneered all of this crazy stuff. I'm sure the people at Adobe were like, they're using what for what? And now it's industry standard. You can't get away from using Photoshop if you're already interested in doing comics, at least in color. All right, so I'm using these, these thicker lines around the eye area to kind of denote that this is a hard edge and that these eyes are sunken in. So that's why I like using these thick to thin lines. All right, I should do a, a quick explanation of what a tangent is. Mathematically speaking, if you have like a, a curve and a line, this area here is a tangent. When we're drawing, when we're inking, when we're doing anything with lines, let's say I have a, let's say I have a box here and then I draw another box that starts here. Uh, this area becomes problematic because this line, this line doesn't break. So this line defines one edge of this box and another edge of this box. Um, and that's confusing for the eye. We can get rid of this with coloring and shading and stuff like that, but the strongest illustrations look really good just with plain line art. And color and shading only enhance it. So uh, if you got janky stuff in your inking or your line art, it's gonna, it's gonna make the colorist's job a little bit more tricky. So to get rid of a tangent like this, what we should do is either separate the boxes so that visually you can see that, hey, they're two different things. They don't run into each other. Or you could be very tricksy and false and kind of nudge one of them. So you can tell that this one is in front of this one. So when you're inking things, even if it's a creepy creature like this, you want to be aware of tangent areas and kind of avoid them, unless they're intentional. And sometimes they might be intentional, but in general, you don't want that stuff to creep into your work. What was that? That was ugly. <laughs> Sometimes you make an ugly line. What's great about digital ugliness is you can erase it. Oh, don't forget to save, save often. Saving should just become second nature. It's really bad sometimes when I'm <laughs> drawing on paper my left hand will do the motion for uh saving and it and nothing will happen and i'll be like what oh <laughs> okay so let's turn off the sketches see what we got here in general Could use some more of these fiddly bits. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good for now. Inking can take a lot out of you. So before we get on to the final stretch of this entire process, take a break, stretch out your fingers. This is what I like to do personally, this is like a, a climbing stretch, we call it praying up and palms together, squeeze in and then get a little wrist action. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna stretch out my right wrist, palm facing you, reach around, grab the meat of the thumb, the meat of the thumb, and then pull towards you so that your pinky is facing your face and then pull it in. Get a nice stretch, pull it down. There you go. If you want to get real froggy with it, drawing hand this away, other hand comes across this away. Bring it in, shake them out, shake them out, shake them out, shake them out, shake them out. Get that shoulder action going. <laughs> Maybe some neck stretches. All right, you are ready. Let's do this. Before we get started, we need to flatten this image, which basically means using basic colors to separate objects from each other. Technically, this part of the demo can be a click of a button because there's a plugin that you can use to flat your illustration. But I'm trying to do these demos so that you don't have to buy anything. Um, but if you think that you might want to pursue coloring or comic illustration as a profession, it might be a good investment to pick up that plugin. And I'll 
put a link in the show notes wherever you see this so you you can go out and pick it up uh, but we're gonna do this by hand which is the boring way <laughs> Uh, but you got to learn somehow. All right. So first things first, we got our inks in a group. I think I have it set up. Yeah, these are the face inks and these are the owl hat. So we're going to set up another group and we're going to call it colors. And we're going to start with a flatting layer. Flats. You may be asking yourself, why doesn't you just use the bucket tool? Well, I will show you why I don't just use the bucket tool. So I've grabbed the bucket tool, I've turned on all the layers so I don't have to mess up my line art. I'll turn on anti-aliasing just to pretend that this is the way I would do it. And bam, bam, bam. All right, from this distance, it looks like everything is colored in. But as I zoom in, you'll see this wacky halo around all the lines, which is not what you want when you're going for a professional look. Uh, and as we zoom in, we can see why it's because the ink lines are aliased, which means it's not pure black all the way through. The edge of the lines has these pixels that are gray and transparent, and the bucket tool gets kind of confused. Now there, you can fiddle with the settings so that it gets really, really close to being all the way filled in, but then you have this other problem. And if you turn off the line area, you have these white outlines in your colors. And this becomes a problem when you try to print it out because you'll get that weird halo around every link. The flatting process makes sure that all the colors go right up into the edge and are trapped by the black. So there are a couple settings we need to change for that. We wanna make sure every tool that we use when we flat has the anti-aliasing turned off. And this is why. So uh, right now, anti-aliasing, I'm using a regular brush, which by nature has the anti-aliased on and uh, we got a, a swatch of color that's red and let's use a green all right let's say i want to change this green to like a blue so grab the blue grab our bucket tool which is g and hit it all right now if i zoom out it mostly looks like all the green is now blue but if we zoom in we can see that there's a little green halo that's still left let's say i want to change the blue to something like a yellow bam now we have, see that line is like blue, green, and let's, what if we do it red? So as we go further and further, this, this track line is gonna get bigger and bigger. So when we flat things, we wanna use anti-aliasing. So instead of using a brush tool, I wanna use the pencil tool because by default, the pencil tool is aliased, which means everything that you see is either red or not there. And let's get our green again. Now, if we want to turn that section blue, we hit our tool and bam. Now all the green pixels are now blue right up to the edge. Okay, so when you're flatting colors, turn off all the aliasing, all the aliasing that you can get. Turn it all off. Uh, I like to start with the polygon lasso because I like to use as few clicks as possible. Um, now, if you have characters that don't have a background, which means you're a lazy cartoonist, you should be ashamed. But I mean, sometimes it happens. So um, if you have a drawing like this, where it's just a, a bust of a person, you can cheat a little bit. What you can do is um, grab your um, wand tool. And this is one of the few cases where it's not gonna be perfect um, in terms of anti-aliasing and aliasing. Um, but uh, sample all layers, so that means everything you see here. Uh, you're gonna swatch the outside, and then go to selection, expand that selection. I like to expand it by three pixels. So bam. And then inverse that selection, and then fill with your flat color. Whoops, I have to turn off all layers. Then fill with your flat color. So now everything is colored in and uh, you can begin the process of separating the rest of it out. But we're not, gonna, we're not gonna cheat. Let's pretend that this character is in front of a background, and I've done a background. Just pretend that there's background. So now we have to do it by hand. Now, uh, you'll notice I'm flatting with uh, a red color. I like to flat, I, I like to start off with a really bright color, just because it helps me ensure that I've colored everything. And because everything has, because all my shades have the 
aliasing off. If I need to change it to something else, I can just do that. All right, so um, starting off with the polygon tool, to move around, you just hit the space bar, your hand tool comes up and then you let go and you're back at your polygon tool. So the polygon lets me use as few clicks as I need to cover the entire thing. And I like to work in full screen mode again. I'm aiming for the middle of the line, which ensures that when this prints out, the color is trapped underneath the line. You can get a job just flatting pages, um, but you have to be able to like flat five pages a day or something like that, something ridiculous. And the pay isn't great, but if you want to get your foot in the door at a comic book company or work with an illustrator, you can start out as a professional flatter. Uh, it's grunt work. It sucks. Uh, it's pretty boring, but if your goal is to, to get in the industry, everyone needs a flatter. All right, now marching ants, uh, which is what I call these lines when um, the marquee tool is activated, isn't always the best way to check to see if you've gotten everything. So sometimes I use the, the quick mask tool, which is you hit Q and um, everything in white is masked, masked, everything pink is not. So this is a good way to just spot check your selections. Looks good to me, so I'm going to fill this area. I use option delete, which fills your selection with the foreground color, which is this red that I've chosen. Flood fill. There we go. This is our selection. We've got the base character separated from the background. And uh, for the background, I'm going to just swatch in a generic gray, basic gray. Bam. Uh, yeah, a little bit darker. Bam. I am going to lock the position because you don't want to be working and then all of a sudden uh, move your uh, move your selection around. And then I'm going to lock the transparency. So when I'm messing around with the rest of this stuff, I don't accidentally draw outside of the line. First, I'm going to separate the face from the owl bits. And I'm going to start with a generic flesh tone. I like to work with the, the largest shape possible and then work towards the foreground. So I'll start with the outline of a body um, and then I'll start with the flesh tones to separate those out and then the costume and then the any big areas that I can separate out, separate out and then go into the, the finer details like the eyes or the nails or stuff like that. So um, for here, uh, I started with the outline of the entire character. Now we're going to go into some of the larger areas like the, the flesh tones. You can use the lasso tool as well. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll use the pencil tool and just draw stuff to separate out. But I think these shapes are big enough where I can just use the lasso tool. So, Because I've locked the transparency, when I um, hit this with color, I won't be colored outside the line. So I'm going to use the, the option delete function again. If I didn't have transparency, if I didn't have the transparency locked, this, this would happen. You don't want that, so make sure that's locked. In your bucket tool, if you have continuous selected, you're only going to get the top part of the owl. If you uncheck continuous, anything that is this red is going to get filled. So both parts are going to get filled that way. As you're flatting, remember to click on or click off depending on, on what you need. Sometimes continuous makes it go faster, sometimes it doesn't. So just, you know, keep an eye on that. All right, there we have everything flatted. Easiest way to shade this is just cell shading, which uses one tone for a shadow and then maybe a, a secondary tone for highlights. This is the, the direction of the light. Now, when you're going through this, you want to kind of remember that all objects are either a sphere, a cube, a tube, or a cone. So it's a variation, uh, it's a combination of all of those shapes. Cell shading 
defines the the extremes of the edges so when when you're shading an object you kind of want to let me see if i can map this out if this makes sense sometimes i talk and it doesn't make sense um so the nose shape is is really made up of uh planes like this these are the planes of the nose and depending on where the light comes from um so since the light is coming from this direction you wanna you would want to shade in here um, and then, you know, these are the planes of the face, so you'd want to shade a little bit in here and a little bit in here, and then the rest of the face goes this way. Uh, same thing with a creature. Um, you've got a, a plane here, and we'll put this on top so you can see it. You've got a plane here, um, there's kind of a plane here. Uh, you know, there's a there's a dip off in here. So cell shading kind of defines all these planes for you. So it's almost like 3D modeling. Like this this entire part here would be in shadow, like here and here, and all this stuff. This would be in shadow. So that's kind of what you want to think about when you're doing your cell shading. Uh, but also uh, do what looks right. <laughs> so there's some there's some cheats that you would want to do. Possibly all of this stuff would be in shadow, but not always. You want to look for planes in your object, and those are the things that you want to define with your cell shading. I'm going to create two new layers. Name one shadow, and we're going to name the other one highlight. Select both of them and turn them into clipping masks. I'll show you with it without the clipping mask. So right now, if I just select the shadow layer and I start drawing on my shadow layer, if I go outside the lines, that's what happens. As soon as I turn this into a clipping mask, it cuts off anything that isn't happening below it. This is great if you separate your characters from your backgrounds when you're flatting. Sometimes you flatten an entire page on one layer, so you can't really do this technique, but for demonstration purposes, this is what we're gonna do. I like to use a multiply layer, and I like to use a um, medium purple tone this tone can be changed whenever you want, so after. Uh, but for general layout, I like to use like a medium purple color. And we're going to use our regular brush, so get off the pencil. And I'm going to use my um, generic round with pressure sensitivity turned on. Um, you don't have to use multiply. You could, you could use some other layer mode, like a color burn or something else, but Multiply is great for just starting out. Um, I'm gonna start here, cause the hand is the easiest one to create a shadow on the face. You don't have to be ultra realistic. This is comics. This this type of coloring isn't going for super realism anyway, so. Um, maybe if there's a, if this was a more realistic style, you might get a little bit more into the, the finer details of how the light lays and all that kind of stuff and light reflection and things like that, but uh, we're not going to bother with that because this is just a simple, de simple demo. You can get really lost in these details. So pick and choose which ones you want to pull out. They don't have to. You don't have to trace every line with a shadow if you don't want to. All right, zoom out just a little bit to see where you're going. So this is with the shading. This is without the shading. We're getting getting somewhere here. That highlight probably wouldn't be there in real life, but. Stick it in anyway. Now, the anatomy of these things is a little wonky, but I mean, eh, it works. Sometimes what I like to do is use a, a gradient to kind of give the shadow portion a little bit more personality. So let's turn on our gradient. Let's grab a a warm color, like an orange. And then let's grab a cooler, like a purple, like that. And I'll start from where I want the light to be shining brightly. So I'll start from one area to the next. Bam. So this kind of warms up the, the shadow up towards where the light would be and darkens it over here. And without changing too much, we've got a little bit more personality with our shadow tones there. Um, if I wanted to do it the opposite direction, you get a little bit more drama. It feels like maybe there's some 
lava or something coming from the bottom there. Um, if we wanted to get really dramatic, I'd pick a really dark shade, like maybe a really dark purple here and put that in here. So that's a little bit more drama into that shadow without actually having to do too much. Like this is kind of a neutral pose, but with this darker shadow, it's, it feels like there's something more dire that's going to happen. Um, if you want it to look a little bit sickly, use a green, and there's something kind of off-putting about that. So once you have your basic shadows in, you can get really creative and do all sorts of weird things to kind of change the mood of your piece. For highlights, it's really easy to go kind of crazy with the highlighting. Um, I usually start off with screen and turn that, turn this layer down to, let's start off with 80%. Sometimes I go all the way down to 50. And for screen tones, I like to use kind of an orange color. Just go in. Things that are supposed to be shiny get highlights. Things that are sharp get highlights. Edges of stuff get highlights. Other things that I like to highlight are goopy bits. So like all this pink fleshy stuff in here is supposed to be very wet looking. Comics in the, the early 90s when coloring first started to become a digital thing, you'd see covers with all sorts of highlights everywhere. Like, you know, you'd have the nose would be highlighted and the cheeks would be highlighted and the lips and then all this stuff. It was a very shiny era. And if that's the style you're going for, that's cool too. But, you know, sometimes a little goes a long way. Uh, but sometimes um, what I will do is is throw in a um, a black a backlight in the shadow parts, and I'll usually use a blue, a darker blue for that. And so see where this hand is all in shadow. This part of the hand is all in shadow. It kind of bleeds it into here. So what I'll do is I'll I'll use this blue to kind of pop it out, separate it from the background a little bit that's a little too too bright so I want a darker blue here and just follow the contours of the most extreme thing that's in shadow it's a pretty subtle effect but I like it sometimes because it helps rounds out what's going on here basic cell shading it's a simple technique, but it gives you a lot of variety in terms of experimentation or establishing mood or just um, goofing around, trying something out. So once you get the basic stuff down, I highly recommend you going back and just fiddling with the settings, fiddling with the different layer modes and, and trying something different um, just to see what else you can push. Uh, sometimes you can even make your shadow just a normal color. And uh, let's see, we can turn that into like a dark gray or something like that. And maybe that gives you an interesting effect that you like. So just once you have your basic shadows down and your basic highlights down, play with the layer modes, play with using different shades as your multiplier or your screen tone and just have a lot of fun with it. This, this is supposed to get you started on a long journey to discover a, a workflow that works for you. All right, I think I'm done rambling. <laughs> so there you go. That's how I draw my comics with a couple of variations. I've, I use Clip Studio these days, but that's basically how it goes. Before I go, I wanna remind you to take your time and have patience with the process and also patience with yourself. Drawing takes time. This whole thing was about three hours and I've cut it into, I don't know however long this particular video is. I hope I've cut out some of the boring parts so at least it's easier to follow along, but this is a very long process and it takes time, but it's, it's worthwhile. The more you practice, the faster it will get for you so you can spend more time on little fiddly details. Like you would think that if you 
get faster, you would get faster. But nope, what I have found that as I get faster with certain aspects of this process, I spent more time with other aspects of the process. So coloring used to take more time than the rest of this stuff. Now I've colored so many pages for so long, I can do that relatively quickly. And now I spend a lot more time on my inks. Drawing digitally opens up a couple of new worlds for you, especially when it comes to color and different types of techniques, but it doesn't necessarily make things faster or easier. So hopefully while you've seen how straightforward this process is, you also realize that it's a process that takes time. Be patient with yourself, be patient with your work, and just keep going. You're gonna get stuck, but you can figure your way out, I promise you. If you have questions about any of this stuff, please drop a note below and I will answer to the best of my ability. I cannot wait to see what you create. Please share with everybody. Comics are awesome and that's how I like to connect with people, so please, definitely tell us about whatever you're making when you're done with it. And thank you very much for taking the time to spend here with me and, and your computer. <laughs> Bye.